2 Kings chapter 23, and I want to read just a few verses of Scripture, beginning at the fourth verse. It simply reads, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places, in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem under the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron. He stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Everybody say Josiah was angry. Josiah was angry. And it, and it, gets, it goes on, verse number 14. And he break in pieces the images Josiah did. He cut down the groves. He filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place. He broke down. He burned the high place, stamped it small to powder. He burned the grove. He was in the process of executing righteous indignation. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Then Josiah said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. There were two sets of bones in that sepulcher. And I would like, by the help of the Holy Ghost, to preach to you on this subject this morning. Buried with the bones of the prophet. Buried with the bones of the prophet. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer, shall we? Jesus, in this house today, you have filled it with your glory. You have filled it with your presence. I ask, Holy Ghost, that you would continue to move, continue to flow, O oh God. Let the power of your Spirit move upon your people, I pray. Allow your word to go forth with clarity and with fervor and boldness in Jesus' name. God, we give you the praise and the glory for it. In the matchless and the omnipotent name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. And Amen. God bless you this morning. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. He was laying upon his deathbed and made one final and very unique request of his children and grandchildren and even further down the line. He said, I know that we are now living in a place called Egypt. But I want you to understand it is my desire that as though I'll be buried in Egypt, that goes without saying, it is my desire that when the promise of God is fulfilled, that we will be taken from this land of captivity and placed into a promised land. I want you to promise me that you will unearth my bones, gather my bones together and carry me along with you when you leave this land. Should it happen? 
200 years from now, yea, 400 years from now, whenever it happens, whenever we're freed, I want you to take my bones with you out of Egypt and into the land of promise. Quite an interesting request. And amazingly enough, parents pass this request on down to their children. And those children pass this request of the patriarch Joseph on down to their children. And on the news traveled through generational lines. How important it is to pass the message down through generational lines. And when it finally came to the time where it was the moment that the children of Israel would be taken out of Egypt and brought into a place where God would lead them into the promised land, that a man of God by the name of Moses remembered amongst the chaos. You must remember there was great chaos in the day of the Exodus. The water was turning to blood. The the Locusts were multiplying at a rapid rate and filling the land. The, the uh, cattle was stricken with incurable and mysterious illnesses. And, and, and Moses somehow had the presence of mind, even though Pharaoh's heart was continually flip-flopping from being hardened to being, to being tenderized. And yet Moses had the presence of mind to say, before we leave Egypt, we've got to gather the bones of our father Joseph. And they did just that. They gathered up the bones of the patriarch Joseph. They left Egypt with the bones of the prophet Joseph. And, and, and they served, I'm sure, a very valuable purpose, even beyond honoring the request of Joseph. But in the area of being able to refer to them, to children and to their children, that here lie the bones of a great man of God, that loved God, that was dedicated to God, that gave his life to the will of God. And this, these bones represent a legacy worth aspiring to. These bones represent a life that was well lived. The, life, the likes of which we should have ambition to live after. And so they served a great purpose even beyond honoring the request of Joseph. And, and, and bones are not mystical. They're... they're they're not, this whole thing about carrying the bones, it was an honoring of a life that was lived. We do the same thing by putting bones into a casket when a loved one passes away. Finding a place for them in either a graveyard or a mausoleum. And then when we go to these places, we ask our children to tone their voices down. And kind of slow their feet so that we can give proper respect to those that have passed on. What are we respecting? Are we respecting their bones? No, not in and of themselves. We are respecting the life that was lived that is represented by the bones. And so we simply say we have no tangible connection to this individual any longer. We understand that they live on in the Lord, but, but, but not, not in the physical sense. They are no longer with us. And the bones are the final physical representation of the life that this individual lived. I remember standing in Luxembourg, along with Sister Urshan, looking out over the American military cemetery that was dedicated to the American soldiers who gave their lives in World War II. And we were standing there looking at these, these white crosses that were innumerable. It was, it was so multitudinous, you couldn't, you couldn't count them. And, and as we looked across this vast landscape of crosses dotting this cemetery, I thought to myself, none of these men know me or knew me. None of them knew my name. I don't know their names. And yet they died so that I could be free. How appropriate then that we should set aside a place where their memory can be honored. How appropriate then, how fitting that we should have a designated location. Where we can say, here are the bones of a valiant man. Here lie the bones of a good man. This is what bones represent. And this is why bones were honored in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and, and now as we live today. Solomon was the wisest man ever to live other than Jesus Christ. Jesus let it be plainly understood. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. But he was wiser than, than your average Joe, let me put it that way. And so Solomon was 
was uh, this great man of God who inherited this kingdom from David and had the responsibility of building the temple. As you know, the wives that he selected later in life turned his heart away from the Lord. And here Solomon now hands over a kingdom to his son Rehoboam that was fractured. It was, it was beginning to come apart at the seams. Rehoboam takes this kingdom and problems immediately begin to develop. Rehoboam and Jeroboam begin to power struggle. And factions begin to feel that, uh, that they're wanting to go a different direction. All of a sudden, Jeroboam decides that there needs to be a division in the kingdom. Rehoboam and Jeroboam have a division in the kingdom. Judah and Israel begin to develop autonomy each of them. There were efforts to reunify, but they were futile. And Jeroboam at first was open to the idea. And then he decided that, you know, I don't necessarily want this after all, because I don't want to go back to being a secretary in Rehoboam's cabinet. I, I kind of like being the king of, of Israel. I'm enjoying the pomp and the circumstance and the perks and the privileges. And so Jeroboam just decided that he was going to stay on that side of Israel and there's a problem, however, because the scripture says that one day a year, every year, all of the children of Israel that had ever walked the earth were expected by the Lord to come to Jerusalem to worship God, to send forth a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. It didn't matter where they were living. They were expected to come back to Jerusalem. And when they come back to Jerusalem, they are there to give their honor and their allegiance and their worship to God. This was bad for Jeroboam because Jeroboam would have lost his power if people started going back to Jerusalem and remembering all of the wonderful feats that God had performed in their life. If people started going back to Jerusalem and remembering and seeing all of the sentimental things that reminded them of how wonderful God really is. So Jeroboam came up with a plan. I'm going to establish another form of worship. I'm going to put an altar, one in Bethel, and I'm going to put an altar in Dan. I'm going to build golden calves. And on the, eighth, the 15th day of the eighth month of every year, Instead of going to Jerusalem, people can come to Bethel or they can come to Dan and they can worship God in Bethel and in Dan. Golden calves. People did just that. He made Israel to sin. And this was the title that stuck with him, the infamous title that stuck with Jeroboam for the remainder of his kingship and his legacy throughout history. The one who made Israel to sin. People would come back to Jerusalem but they didn't have to go all the way back to Jerusalem because Jeroboam had performed a, a great feat in many people's eyes. He made it convenient for them not to go all the way to Jerusalem. Why? They could stop halfway and worship in Bethel. It wouldn't be God that they were worshiping, but they could go halfway and worship Bethel, this golden calf. Beware of convenient worship. Beware of haphazard praise. Beware of just going halfway and, and praising God at a place of convenience. You know what? It's not always convenient to praise and worship God the way God expects us to praise and worship Him. But I want to please God more than I want to please myself. Hallelujah. And so here they were coming to these golden camps. This enraged God. Did not like to see his people making a trek to Bethel. He didn't want them making a trek to Dan, worshiping these golden calves. He wanted them to worship him, the one true and living God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Him only shalt thou serve. Hallelujah. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I want you to love me with all your heart and mind and soul and body and strength. Give me all of you, God would say. And so they come to Bethel and they go to Dan. They worship idols. They worship idols. And, and then finally, God was so enraged that he began to deal with the mind of a young prophet. And he said to this prophet, he said, I want you to go prophesy to Jeroboam. 
I want you to tell him. I want you to tell him that I am displeased with the building of the golden calves. I want you to let Jeroboam know that, that it is not my will that my people would worship any God but me. It is not my will that my people would worship any, any spirit but my spirit. And so let him know that I am going to judge these altars. I'm going to bring my wrath upon these endeavors. And so this prophet was commissioned of God. The anointing of the Holy Ghost just boiling in his mind as he went forward to prophesy, risking his own life, mind you, prophesied to King Jeroboam. He comes to King Jeroboam, walks into the room and just just starts prophesying. It just pours out of his mouth, finds him at the altar in Bethel where the golden calf stands. There he is, caught in the act of worshiping a golden calf. And this young prophet said, King Jeroboam, I want you to know that I come to you today with a word from the Lord. I want you to hear what the Lord has to say. You have displeased God. It is not his will that the golden calves be worshipped. It is his will that the Lord be magnified. It is his will that God be glorified. And there will come a day when a king will be born. This king's name will be Josiah. Ladies and gentlemen, he called him by name. His name will be Josiah. And when he comes into his kingship, he will not let this idolatry rest. He will uproot this idolatry. He will tear down the groves. He will cut in pieces the images. He will break down every high place. No idolatry shall stand. The house of the priests that offer incense to false gods will be torn down and destroyed. The bones will be desecrated so as to dishonor and discredit the legacy that they were trying to leave. And so he prophesied this to King Jeroboam. Jeroboam was so upset that he would dare prophesy this to him that he actually lifted up his hand to order the execution of this prophet. And as he did, his hand and withered in the sight of all his servants. It literally crippled right in front of everybody and was drawn unto him. He begged the prophet, pray for my hand. And the prophet beseeched the Lord and the Lord healed his hand, thereby verifying the fact that I speak with the power of God. Hallelujah. Jeroboam was then afraid. Jeroboam said, I know that you've come to me with a word from the Lord. And you have spoken things in my hearing that have greatly intrigued me. Come to my house. Talk to me more about what you're saying. And, and the prophet said, I can't do that. God told me not to go to anybody's house. Not to sit down and eat with anybody. Not to sit down and drink with anybody. I can't go to anybody's house. I am commissioned of the Lord to prophesy His Word and then to go home the way, another way actually, than I came. I cannot come to your house. And he went on his way. Word began to spread like wildfire. People were already up in arms, some of them that were still in true, being true to God, up in arms about the golden calves in Bethel and in Dan. Finally, word reached the ears of an old prophet who said, you know what? That's, that's, I knew that was going to happen one day. I knew it was going to anger God that false gods were being worshipped. I knew it was going to make God sad and displeased and, and filled with wrath that there were false gods and false idols being exalted above the name of God. And so, so, so he said, somebody find that prophet. I want to talk to him. So they found the prophet sitting under the shade of an oak tree. And when they did, he said, I want you to come to my house. I can't come to your house. You have to come to my house. I want you to talk to me more about this king that's coming. That's going to uproot the idolatry in the land. This king that's coming that's going to tear down the groves and break down the images. This king that's come and, and, and talk to me in my house. I can't come to your house. God said no. But I'm a prophet too and it's alright. And he said, okay, I'll go to your house. 
When he goes to the prophet's house, they sit down at the table and the old prophet was, was, was anxious to hear more about what the Lord had said. He said, so what was this king's name? Will I see him? Will he be in my children's generation? Well, when, when is this going to happen? I'm excited to see revival restored in the land. I'm excited to see. I want to see the temple of the Lord established in the land. I'm ready to see some real worship. I'm ready to see an altar of incense. I'm ready to see a Holy of holies. When is this going to happen? And the young prophet and he were talking and all of a sudden this Lord spoke to the old prophet and said, you were too anxious that you thought that obeying my word was not applicable to you. And he absolutely, he absolutely was stunned with fear as he realized that he had endangered the life of this prophet. He said to him, you are going to die now by a vicious beast on your way home. The young prophet went his way. And sure enough, a vicious beast came out of nowhere, attacked him, killed him. And the old prophet could not rest. He wanted to know what happened to the young prophet. He couldn't even, couldn't even, couldn't even be content by himself. And so he gathered up some servants and they went on their way. We've got to find this man. They tracked down the direction he would have traveled. And when they arrived at this very sinister place, at the head of a body was the mule that he was riding. At the foot of this body was the lion that killed him. And there was this mutilated body just laying there, having been murdered by a lion. The old prophet, I can't imagine imagine the mixture of emotions that was going through his mind right there. Realizing that he had endangered this prophet's life. Realizing that that he had had made a bad decision. And he's looking at this situation. and, And he sees this mutilated body. And as he... As he's observing this, all of a sudden he gets this idea. He begins to think back upon what the prophet said. How that a king would come. How that the idolatry that was so popular at the time would not be popular forever. How that that all of the ungodliness and all of the immorality and all of the rebellion against the Lord was going to be put aside when this mysterious king, Josiah, I think his name was, would be born. And he got this idea as he began to hear about how that the groves would be broken in pieces and the altars would be desecrated and the bones of the prophets and the priests that delivered incense into the false gods would all be desecrated. He said, listen, listen, listen to his young men with him. I want you to gather this man's bones up and go bury his bones. And when you do that, I want you to mark the grave. Because when I die, I want you to bury me with the bones of the prophet. Make sure that when you bury him, you mark the grave with a plat. Because I want to be buried with the bones of the prophet. One book. And ten chapters later, there's a little baby born in the king's house. They named the baby Josiah. All of a sudden, the wheels of prophecy begin to turn. Slowly but surely, the providence of God comes into effect. And everybody was drunken in their intoxication of immorality. Everybody was drunken with their insistence on rebelling against the Lord. And yet this wheel of prophecy began to go into motion. This young king at eight years of age, it was almost like God couldn't wait to start the process. At eight years of age, the horn of oil is tipped over his head and it falls on his head and drips down over his face and onto his garments. And and Josiah becomes the king over the people of God. And Josiah begins to operate in his kingship. Finally, several years later in the reign of Josiah, somebody was just kind of shuffling around in the old temple. They didn't need it like they used to need it. You see, it wasn't used for worshiping Jehovah anymore. And as they were just kind of moving around in the temple, they found some scrolls and they brought it 
to the king and they read these ancient writings in his ears. And this king is hearing what they're right, what the writings say. These are the books of the law. These are the words of God. These are the words handed from Moses to the people of the Lord. And as he hears these words, it startles him to realize how far they had drifted from the plan God originally had for them. So these words are coming forth from these pages and these writers are just reading it off. He can't believe what he's hearing. He knows how many idols are in the city. They're under every green tree. They're on every high hill. They're in living rooms. They're in marketplaces. They're on, on street corners. Everywhere you look, there's idols, 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 idols. And here in black and white, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And Josiah put his hand to his brow. He said, my Lord, how far have we drifted? They said, oh, you haven't heard at all. Listen to this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And Him only, 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 shalt thou serve. He was shocked, startled, as he realized they had drifted from God. All of a sudden, his shock turned into mandate. As he realized there's only one thing to do, he went over and grabbed his kingly garment and wrapped it around his shoulders. He grabbed his weaponry. He called and summoned his chariots. He went and took his crown grabbed his scepter, he began to move into a position of executing the judgments of God. Now the prophecy train was full steam ahead. Josiah walks into the land of God's people and he begins to do exactly what the prophet said he would do. He begins to uproot every grove. He begins to cut down every high place. He desecrates altars, burns them and stamps them small to powder. He was endued with an anointing from God to execute the judgment of the Lord. As he's operating in this realm of divine unction, he's almost wild. He's just breaking stuff. Even if it doesn't have to be broken, he breaks it. He's breaking limbs off of trees. He's just, he's just, he's just in a rage, a righteous rage, doing what God wants him to do. And he's just breaking down idolatry. It'll never resurface in this land. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to smell it. I don't want to think it. I want it out of this land and I want it out now. And all of a sudden he sees as he, he sees this whole row of graves up on the hillside. He says, I'm going up there. They go up there. He said, what's this grave? They said, well, these are the graves of the high priests that offered incense unto Baal. Open them up. They opened up the graves. He went inside, grabbed the bones, burned them, stamped them small to powder, and let the winds blow them into the air, never to be seen again. He said, I desecrate the legacy they're trying to leave. I don't want our children to know about the idolatry. I don't want our children to think about what these ungodly individuals were doing. Burn it, stamp it, grind it, get it out of here. And he just, every sepulcher, open it up, roll away the stone. He went inside, grabbed more bones. Here's more bones. Here's more bones. Crush it. Break it. Get it out. And then all of a sudden, he came to a very peculiar looking grave. And there was a little plaque that had a title on it. Evidently, it was in an ancient language that Josiah was not familiar with. Because he said, what title is that that I see? And they said, well, now let's try to read what it says. It says here that in this grave lie the bones of a man of God that prophesied 
that what you're doing right now would happen one day. You mean that the bones of the prophet that said I would do what I'm doing right now, uh, they're inside this grave? Yes, yes. Do you want us to break those bones? Can we break them, Cain? He said, no, you can't break those bones. I want those bones to last. I want those bones to be preserved. I want that legacy to live on. I want that aspiration and that ambition to be everlasting. That old prophet knew exactly what he was doing when he was looking at the bones of that young prophet. He said, if there really is going to be a King Josiah, and he's really going to tear down the idolatry, and he's really going to remove all the high places, and he's going to desecrate the bones of these high priests... I don't want my bones to get mixed up with their bones. So make sure when I die, you bury me with his bones because he's going to last. I don't want to get pushed off with the rest of them. I don't want to burn with the rest of them. I want to get a hold of something I know is going to last. Something that's going to stand the test of time. Come on, I know it's not popular to be one God right now. I know it's not popular to be pure in the Holy Ghost right now. I know it's not popular to live for God right now. But one day, one day, one glorious day. You've got to get a hold of something that you know will stand the test of time. Don't mess around with things that are going to just filter through. You've got to get a hold of something that's going to stand strong. Get a hold of something that's going to last forever. Hallelujah. You know what's going to... Can I preach to you? You know what's going to last forever? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God, the word Word of our God, the word of our God shall stand forever. Uh, my God. Rolling Stone magazine had been paid to run an ad about the new, new international version of the Bible. They wanted to reach. A segment of society that would be reading Rolling Stone magazine. When the push came to shove, Rolling Stone magazine said, we're not going to run an ad in our magazine about any version of the Bible. It is not relevant to this generation. It is not in, it is not on the same page as what we are wanting to espouse. And so since the word is so antiquated, and since the Bible is something that is just a far distant cry from what people really are wanting today, we don't want to run it in our magazine. You know what, Rolling Stone? You can choose to do that all you want, but the word still stands. The word still stands. It may not be popular right now. It wasn't popular when that old prophet was looking down at the body of that young prophet. Everywhere around him, people were worshiping other gods. Everywhere around him, people were living in immorality and sinfulness and shame. But he knew that there will come a day when a king will step into this earth. Come on, somebody. It may not be popular right now, but there is coming a day when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to step foot on this earth. And when he does, you better have a hold of something that's going to last beyond this world. Come 
Come on, I got to get a hold of this book. I got to get a hold of this word of God. I got, it doesn't matter if my friends don't think it's popular. It doesn't matter if peer pressure says it's not good. It's what God wants, and that's what lasts. Yeah, you've got to get a hold of something that lasts. When we're looking for a spouse, we don't look at their bone structure. We look at their skin, their eyes, their hair. That's what we're looking for. But I'm going to tell you, the skin's going to pass. And the eyes are going to pass. And the hair is going to pass. But the bones will stand forever. The bones last and stand the test of time. You better get a hold of something that stands the test of time. You better get a hold of the bones of the prophet. We've got to be buried with the bones of the prophet. That's why the Bible says that we are buried with him. Buried with him. Buried with him. By baptism into his death. Hallelujah! I want you to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. There are things that last. And then there are things that are just temporary. Let me tell you what lasts. The church lasts. The body of Christ lasts. The body of Christ lasts. When they came up to the when they came up to the cross where Jesus was crucified, the custom was that it came time for them to break his bones. But the prophecy had already been given. Not a bone of him shall be broken. You can't break a bone on the body of Christ. Because that body lasts. You can't break a bone on the body of Christ. They wanted to, but prophecy was against them. Hear what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen. The devil may want to destroy the church of the living God all he wants. But you better hang on to the church. Hang on to the kingdom. Hang on for all your worth. I know there are winds of doctrines everywhere. Where? But don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Grab a hold and hang on for dear life. It may be tough right now, but there's coming a day. There's coming a day. There's coming a day. Come on, grab a hold of the kingdom. Grab a hold of the word. <laughs> I'm hanging on to this relationship with God. Hallelujah. I want you to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. When Abel came out of that Garden of Eden, when Abel was born unto Adam and Eve, he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. I want you to know that when Noah came off the ark, he came off praising and worshiping God. Hallelujah. I want you to understand that when Miriam and the children of Israel came across the Red Sea, they came across dancing. I want you to understand when the priest walked into the tabernacle, he offered incense up unto the Lord. When God heard the voice of David, he heard it praising and worshiping. Hallelujah. When the children of Israel walked around the walls, they shouted and the walls came tumbling down. When Jesus rode in on a donkey, the Bible says they wave palm leaves and say, Hosanna! 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 Oh, that's just emotion. That's just emotion. No, it's not emotion. It's bigger than emotion. It lasts forever. John saw in the heavens 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands singing, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Come on, you better grab a hold of worship. You better grab a hold of praise. Because it lasts. It lasts. It lasts. It stands forever. Come on, let's give him glory. 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 Come on, let's stand to our feet and give him praise right now.
Oh. Oh. No. World, you can have Britney Spears, Kanye West. Give me Jesus. You can have Jessica Simpson and Justin Timberlake and Usher. I want Jesus. Young people, it doesn't last. It doesn't last. Only Jesus lasts. Only Jesus. Only Jesus lasts. Come on, you can have the methamphetamine and the marijuana and the LSD. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Come on, you can have the sex, the drugs, and the rock and roll. But I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Come on, we're going to grab a hold of something today that stands forever. But Brother Urshan, you don't understand. I'm so far from God. I feel dead in my spirit. You're dead in your spirit today, so far from God, so distanced from the Lord. There's only one thing to do. And they did it in the Old Testament. When that soldier died, they went looking for a grave. Where should we bury this dead body? Somebody said we should bury him with the bones of the prophet. Hallelujah. Peeled back the grave of the prophet Elisha. Hakatana. Everybody ready? One, two, three. And they threw that corpse into the grave with the prophet Elisha. And when that corpse touched the bones of all of my, my, my gosh, touched the bones of the prophet, he came back to life. Come on, I don't know what's happened, but nothing's so bad that you can't come to life. Nothing's so bad you can't get buried with Him, immerse with Him. Come on, somebody needs to break out of their seat. Somebody needs to break out into the aisle and say, I'm coming back to life. I'm coming back to life. I'm coming back to life. Come on, let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. Let's give him worship right now. Come on, that's it.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.